When I was in Armenia, every time I got asked my name for some paperwork, they always spelled it wrong. That's because Armenians are all silly and don't know how to spell that. Wait, wait, wait. Armenians are not silly and there's actually an interesting explanation for their wacky spelling? Alright, fine. But I'm making a video about it. When Mesrop Mashtots invented the Armenian alphabet in 405, it remained largely unchanged until the 13th century when two new letters were introduced to better represent foreign sounds, O and Fe. Incidentally, this was around the same time as the earliest known use of the English word fuck with a sexual connotation. Coincidence? Yes, but funny anyway. Then, the language remained largely unchanged again until 1922, when a reform started taking place in Soviet Armenia. The reform was aimed to make the Eastern Armenian orthography more phonetic. Or to put it in simpler terms, they wanted to make the spelling of words be more like the sounding of words, which just so happened to make it more similar to Russian. More on that later. One of the spelling changes that came with this reform was the spelling of sounds like yo and ya, with the letter yech to the letter he. Don't worry if you can't read Armenian because this happens to map out pretty accurately to this English transliteration, which was also eventually affected by the reforms. And since most Armenian surnames contain a Yan at the end, they were all affected by this spelling change. Outside of Armenia, the Armenian diaspora rejected these reforms and continues to use the classical spelling for Western Armenian to this day. This further distanced the Eastern and Western dialects from each other. And since my roots are Western Armenian, I have been writing my surname in the classical orthography, which is why when I went to Armenia, I thought everyone kept misspelling my name. It's difficult to see the bigger picture when looking only at the Armenian language reform in a vacuum, but when we look at Soviet language reforms overall, a clearer picture emerges. That is, language reforms incited by the Kremlin were only part of the more sinister goal of russifying their vassals. You see, the Soviet Union was comprised of many different nations, each with their own mix of ethnic minorities, cultures and languages. And there's nothing that the Soviet Union loved more than different cultures and languages, as long as they fully assimilated and preferably spoke Russian. But these ambitions were not started in the Soviet Union. They spanned well into Imperial Russia. For instance, the Valuyev Circular from 1863 forbade publications in the Ukrainian language, stating that the Ukrainian language does not and shall not exist, and is merely Russian corrupted by the influence of Polish. In reality, Ukrainian is as much of its own language as Russian is. Both Russian and Ukrainian languages developed from the Old East Slavic language, and Ukrainian has a higher lexical similarity with Polish than Russian. As far as Soviet language reforms went, Armenian got away pretty lightly. For instance, the use of the Arabic alphabet was abolished by the Soviets in 1917, detaching many of their Muslim nations from the Quran. Later, in 1930, they decided that a number of these languages 
would have to use the Cyrillic alphabet. Eventually, almost 20 different varieties of the Cyrillic alphabet were created to prevent minorities from developing a shared non-Soviet identity. In 1938, the Soviet government started mandating the teaching of Russian in every non-Russian school, and the late 1950s saw the growing conversion of non-Russian schools to schools with Russian as the main language of instruction. Armenia's neighbor Azerbaijan was not radically targeted either, and yet, by 1970, Azerbaijan had 57,500 ethnic Azeris who identified Russian as their native language, 1.3% of their population at the time. This is not to be confused with the additional 5.6% of their population who were ethnic Russians by 1989. But getting back to Armenia, were there attempts to suppress the Armenian population in Imperial Russia and Soviet times? During World War I, General Nikolai Yudenich, who led the Russian army into Armenian populated areas of the Ottoman Empire, proposed a plan of deporting the remaining Armenians from their ancestral homes. The Russian government seriously considered a policy of Armenia without Armenians most likely achieved by repopulating Armenian lands by Russian peasants and Cossacks. During the Soviet period, many Armenian writers, artists, scientists, politicians, military commanders and religious figures were either executed or imprisoned in the Great Purge by Joseph Stalin for being enemies of the people. It's hard to put an exact figure, but according to a 1937 letter to Stalin, first secretary of the Communist Party of Armenia, Amaduni Vartanyan, wrote that 1,365 people were arrested in 10 months. Between 1946 and 1949, around 90,000 diasporan Armenians who had been displaced from their homes by the Ottoman Empire during the Armenian Genocide sought to repatriate to a new homeland in Soviet Armenia. Upon arrival, however, they were viewed as outsiders to the communist regime and in 1949, deportations began. Tens of thousands of people were loaded on freight trains in Armenia and sent into the unknown. Some places had their names changed. Most famously, Armenia's second largest city of Gyumri, which had its name Gumayri since Urardian times, was changed to Alexandropol during the Russian Empire to honor Tsar Nicholas' wife Alexandra, and later changed again by the Soviets to Leninagan in honor of Lenin. Finally, the Armenian church was not spared either. The Armenian Catholicos was strangled to death by NKVD agents, which was the interior ministry of the Soviet Union, and the Armenian Catholicate of Echmiadzin was closed down. So while it's true that Armenians received a relatively mild treatment than other Soviet nations, they were still targeted by oppressive policies. But just how successful were these policies? Towards the end of the Soviet Union, less than 40% of Kazakhstan was Kazakh, 70% of Georgia was Georgian, 82% of Azerbaijan was Azeri, and 93% of Armenia was Armenian. Which begs the question, how? There are six reasons that allowed Armenia to retain a relatively high ratio of her native population. 
Number 1. Armenia has developed a rich ethnic culture that is very distinct from that of their neighbors over several millennia. Compared to East Slavic and Turkic ethnic groups, Armenians don't find any of their immediate neighbors in particular culturally similar, making them difficult to homogenize. Number 2. Throughout history, Armenians have had to live under the rule of many different empires from many different cultures, some more oppressive than others. One could make a case that learning to cooperate with different cultures to mutual benefit without fully assimilating to the degree of losing their own cultural identity has been key to the survival of the Armenian people. Speaking of living under foreign rule, Number 3. Due to threats from a genocidal Ottoman Empire and later Turkey, living under Russian rule was perceived as the less objectionable option for Armenians. As a result of this, the Kremlin in turn saw Armenians as relatively loyal and in response the pressure on Armenians to assimilate was lower than that of other nations. Number 4. As a starting point, Armenia did not share a border with Russia, nor hosted a meaningful number of Russian inhabitants. In contrast, many cities in the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union with a Russian population ended up under non-Russian rule through various circumstances. Number 5. Education has been one of the central values of Armenian culture. And as a result, Soviet Armenia had an abundance of highly educated people. This meant that when the Soviets started to industrialize, any large projects that were implemented in Armenia were done so with a minimal inflow of non-Armenian specialists. And number 6, Armenian SSR was the third smallest population of the Soviet republics but enjoyed being the third largest destination for incoming immigration to the USSR. These immigrants were mainly Western Armenians who did not have any connection to Russia. Perhaps paradoxically, the high ratio of Armenians to Russians in Armenia did not mean a worse attitude towards Russians, but the contrary. Around the collapse of the Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union, there was a strong anti-Tsarist and anti-communist sentiment among their nations. This often came with an anti-Russian sentiment. However, while the same anti-Tsarist and anti-communist sentiments were present in Armenia, Armenians especially seemed to have decoupled them from an anti-Russian sentiment. A similar trend can be observed today. While most Armenians oppose Putin and his war in Ukraine, they can still welcome Russian migrants resulting from that war, unlike for instance Georgia, which even though has been the preferred destination for Russian migrants, is also openly unwelcoming towards them. Though neither of these countries have the number one spot as the favorite destination for Russian migrants, as of August 2022, that honor still goes to Turkey, even more so for Russian oligarchs, but I'm getting sidetracked. To get back to the point, Armenians never got to feel the boot pressing down on their throat as heavily as some others. But make no mistake, the boot was definitely there, and I would argue still is. That is something that I think doesn't get talked about enough in Armenian circles, especially in the diaspora. Partly because the equation is made more complicated when the Russian question is frequently weighed against the Ottoman Empire, Turkey and Azerbaijan, which makes it easy to confuse the lesser of two evils 
as not being evil. In 2009, the Russian government began a migration program called Compatriots. This program encouraged Armenians to settle in Russia by offering employment, accommodation and financial benefits. At a time when Armenia was already struggling with falling birth rates and a demographic challenge, the program was rightfully criticized by Armenian sociologists and political analysts for what they saw as yet another attempt to leave in Armenia without Armenians. So I hope you can understand why I can't help but raise an eyebrow when I hear about incidents in Artsakh villages that were supposed to be under the protection of Russian so-called peacekeepers but somehow end up being handed over to Azerbaijan. But that can be the topic of another video. If you enjoyed this video, you might also like my video about the hidden names of Turkish villages and my video on Armenians in Ukraine and why we might have more in common than you may have thought.